So, I was born in in Guyana. That's a small country in the northeast corner of South America. And about a year or so before I was born, Guyana gained its independence from England. Well, luckily for me, my mother managed to get us out of Guyana. And by the time I was seven, I was happily growing up in Canada. For the longest while, the way at least I remember it, my family thought I would be a doctor, a medical doctor, a useful kind of doctor. (laughs) According to them, the thinking at the time, either being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, those were sort of the best we could hope for what we could aspire to. You see, my parents had divorced. My father, he was a businessman. So any sort of wheeling and dealing, that was certainly out of the question. And I was the first, eventually, to go to university. So there was a fair bit of pressure to make good. When I finished my bachelor's of science degree in biology. It was 1990, and Eastern Europe was really exciting. So naturally, I went to Prague, and I found myself a job in a memory laboratory. To pay the bills, I started to sell whiskey and gin, and I, used, and I was using the Institute fax machine. I think it's around then that my family figured out I wasn't going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Prague was a really exciting and wonderful place at that time. And one of the things I remember being (coughs) particularly fascinated with was the concept that was propagated at the time of living in truth. And I became intoxicated with the idea that I could try and understand something fundamental. I would find some basic fact about life, about my own mental life in particular, that I could grasp some truth. In 1992, I came to New York City. That was to do a PhD in neuroscience. And in my mind, what I was going to do is finally understand how those neurons, those millions of neurons, 100 billion or so of them in a human brain, how those neurons could form memories, recollect memories, okay? generate all the perceptions, all the experiences that we call living. That was going to be my life's work. That was going to be my goal. Well, it turns out that was absolutely impenetrable to the family. Getting a PhD, well, that was good. At least I'd be a doctor. (laughs) But the pay, that was embarrassingly little. And I think from their point of view, maybe it made sense. Because as far as they could tell, I wasn't doing anything useful. I was nonetheless happy. (laughs) A vision of myself began to crystallize. I would try, at least, to winkle out of nature some powerful, basic, biological truth and show that to human knowledge, contribute to pure human knowledge. That was my pursuit. Well, to do that, you have to get your hands dirty. And so we invented a bunch of tools along the way. One of those tools became a very interesting side project of the memory laboratory. You see, 
In order to understand how memories are formed and transformed and then expressed, you have to record the electrical activity from neurons. And we were studying the brains, the neurons in the brains of rats. And we had to invent a small, inexpensive, wireless, digital brain recording device to collect that electrical activity. Now, we put those devices, they were very small, we made them, and we put them on the heads of rats so that we could eavesdrop, if you will, on their deep thoughts while they did deep and complicated things. Okay? And in this exercise, what we'd hoped to do was to work out how neurons okay, represent the experiences of rats and by <laughs> inference, that mental life that was so interesting. Well, <clears throat> it turns out that we sort of hit the jackpot in our, in our memory research program. What was interesting is that we managed to discover, be the first to identify, the molecular mechanism for storing memories for a really long time. So that's pretty fundamental. Felt good about that. And that got a lot of press. You see, because people imagined with that kind of knowledge, you could work out one day how to think about and understand and maybe deal with traumatic memories, how stress affects your memories, mental illness, even addiction. So that was pretty exciting. Maybe we wouldn't figure that out, though. Okay? And that was puzzling. Let me tell you about that invention, okay? that invention that was a side project of the memory laboratory, because that turned out very quickly to be something very useful okay? in rather short time. So we had this wireless device, okay? this inexpensive miniature way to record electrical brain activity. And Trying to develop that inexpensive device turned out to be, well, rather expensive. And so I had to form a company, because that's a natural way to collect money. So we formed a company <laughs> to develop this device. Okay. And what the company needed was a way to collect more money. It needed a way, okay, to use this device. But what would one do, actually, with a small wireless brain recording device? That was our task. So under my steady direction, we decided to tackle epilepsy. You see, epilepsy is a big problem. About 1% of humanity suffers from epilepsy. And it's not the loss of consciousness or the convulsions that's actually so debilitating. What's most debilitating is the uncertainty of when you'd have a seizure. With that kind of uncertainty, you have to change what you do for a job. That constrains what you do for fun. That determines how you even get around. So that's a big problem a fundamental problem, we thought. So that's what we decided to tackle. Okay. We were confident we should be able to figure this out. Okay. It turns out that some of the best neuroengineers you know, that ever lived have been working on this problem for decades. Okay. But we would figure it out. Why? Because we were confident. People gave us money. They were confident. We were confident. Okay. <laughs> The National Institutes of Health gave us money to work on this problem. We would work it out. Well, something terrible changed those aspirations and, and, and plans. A friend of mine called me one day. She called me from St. Vincent's Hospital. She had been knocked down by a truck, actually not far from here, crossing the street. She also thought 
that I was a useful kind of doctor, so she called. Okay. And I asked, you know, did you hit your head? And she wasn't clear, but she didn't think she'd hit her head. But in any case, I said, well, get an EEG, have someone look at your brain function. And I tried very hard to get an EEG. So an EEG is a relatively simple neurological recording technique. What you do is you put electrodes on your scalp and you get a functional impression of how the brain is operating. It's very basic. But I couldn't get an EEG for my friend. So she left the hospital thinking she was actually pretty okay. And about six weeks later, she was on a ladder and she zoned out. She had what I think was a minor seizure and she fell. She broke her jaw in five places. That was pretty dramatic. There was no question she had hit her head. But it still took about three months to get an EEG for her. And when she had the EEG, it was very clear. She has epilepsy. So it was pretty clear, looking at my friend, her swollen face, and the scars, while she was in that hospital, that there should be EEG in emergency departments. It was pretty clear, looking at her face, that it would be a good idea to put EEG in every emergency department in the world. Well, this last summer, what we call micro-EEG was approved for clinical use by the FDA. In the clinical trials we've done since, about 400 or so people have had their EEG in a couple of New York City hospitals in the emergency department. And what's remarkable is about 7% of those people were detected to be seizing and no one knew. It's pretty easy to stop a seizure if you know it's happening. And so all of those people survived. But about half of them probably would have died if they didn't have the seizure detected. What I'm particularly happy about, excited about, is four kids I've never met. They live in Malawi, Africa. And <clears throat> they had cerebral malaria, so they were unconscious and brought to a clinic. And that clinic happened to have our micro-EEG. And the micro-EEG detected that they were seizing. Now it's really easy to stop a seizure. You give the kids something like Valium. And I often think about how those parents must have felt sort of the horror and relief as their kids revived from being unconscious. And those four kids were detected just while the clinical staff in Malawi was practicing. They were training to figure out how to use the micro EEG. That was this summer, and they're preparing for a full clinical trial. That clinical trial begins this January, which is the start of the malaria season. Thanks for listening.